Good morning, friends. It's Petra here at Fruition Seeds, and welcome. Can't wait to actually share the farm with you one day. And in the meantime, so glad we can share it here and now. So this is live Q&A. Welcome. Every Saturday, I'm hanging out here between 9.45 and 10.15ish. So jump on in and don't be shy. Today, I'm so excited to tell you about Austrian winter peas and how delicious they are in the cover crop around me. I'm also excited to share with you this beautiful collection of brand new varieties for 2021. And in the meantime, before I get ahead of myself, I love to begin and end all of our live Q&As with some words. And this morning, words from Vandana Shiva. It is not an investment if you are destroying the planet. Again, Vandana Shiva. It is not an investment if you are destroying the planet. I share that with you, especially this morning, because perhaps you have heard about the strikes in India. And if you haven't heard, I am excited to learn so much more. But here's the thing, right now, right now in India, 250 million people are striking. They're striking because a few weeks ago, three main pieces of legislation passed that make it impressively difficult for small farms to exist, much less thrive. And as a result, with 60% of the Indian population actively involved in small agriculture, 250 million people are striking. And what's striking to me about this, you know, I mean, 250 million people, that's just mind-numbing how much cohesion and collaboration and vision they have. But also, I was like, wow, that's a lot of people to care about food and 60% of the Indian population actually is involved in agriculture. That's amazing. I'm not sure what percentage it is here in the United States. Certainly there's not that many people involved in agriculture and certainly that many white people making laws and legislation. And then I thought to myself, wait a minute, hold the phone. Every day that we eat, we are involved in agriculture. And if we think that agricultural law is not <laughs> applicable to us and not worth striking for when it is insidious and <laughs> enriching the people who are already the richest on the planet, which is very accurate, then there's something really wrong. Why are we not in the streets, friends? Stay tuned. We're figuring out ways to stand in solidarity with our Indian friends um, striking and also finding deeper ways that we can be supporting each other as agricultural um, citizens of this planet. So that is why the brilliant Vandana Shiva, our opening quote is her this morning, it is not an investment if you are destroying the planet. So yes, let's dive right in. And this is live Q&A, so don't be shy. I love to hear your questions and I love to learn. I learn as much from you as you learn from me. And so first I would love to begin with this lovely situation in my hands. These are Austrian winter peas. And this is a cover crop that I am surrounded by. And so this is winter rye and also winter Austrian peas. And so the peas are actively fixing nitrogen putting nitrogen into the soil. Can we talk about that for just a moment? Peas and other nitrogen fixing legumes take atmospheric nitrogen, so abundant, and transmute it into biologically available nitrogen in the soil. <laughs> and in the meantime, they're delicious. <laughs> so they actually, and peas, it's not just the peas, the pods themselves that are delicious, it's the leaves. And as the temperatures drop, Sugar is nature's antifreeze. And so all of the starches that are in this, the fibers of this plant are turning into sugar. So it's turning more tender and also more sweet. So admittedly, I love cover crops <laughs> for so many reasons, but certainly because they're delicious sometimes. It's at the top of my list. <laughs> so yes, we've been making salads out of our cover crops for months now. I mean, for years, let's be honest. So without further ado, I'd love to jump in friends. And we have all of these gorgeous new packets for our beautiful new varieties, brand new for 2021. 
to share with you friends. So I'd love to just go through and give you the laundry list of what I love about them. And I'll go pretty quickly if you want more story on any of them. Don't be shy. Just jump in the chat and say, wait, tell me more about Pianolo. <laughs> tell me more about Trombantino. Tell me more about the pink celery. And I'd love to tell you more. So don't be shy. I love it. And I wanted to start with this cherry ember tomato because perhaps you remember a few months back, we actually were coming up with a name for this tomato, asked all you all here on Facebook if <laughs> what we should name it. And there's some wonderful threads from a few months back with literally thousands of comments. So cool. Everyone's submitting um, proposals for the name and then we all voted <laughs> and it was really fun. So thank you for naming this tomato cherry ember and indeed it's a little cherry tomato with these with a lovely little heart shape and then oh my gosh it's a red tomato but look it has these amazing metallic copper bronze streaks on it it's so beautiful and it's so delicious very resistant to cracking lovely trusses it's a brand new variety developed by Phil Griffiths at Cornell. He's a public plant breeder. Um, and of course, you know, he developed this new variety on the shoulders of giants we stand. So thank you to the millennia of indigenous plant breeders, brilliant indigenous plant breeders who have domesticated and been selecting tomatoes for millennia so that Phil could just cross a couple heirlooms and make a really awesome new variety. And Sophia asks, hi, Petra, is cherry ember as sweet as sun gold? There is no tomato that I found that is as sweet as sun gold. Because here's the thing, like Sun Gold is sweet, but it's not super tomato flavor. So what I love about Sun Gold um, is its sweetness, but I don't love that it's kind of unilateral in that sugary sweetness. I love tomatoes that are sweet with great tomato flavor. And so that is much more Cherry Ember style, where it has rich, deep nuances of tomato-ness, and it's super sweet. Um, so is it Sun Gold? No. If you want our sweetest tomato that has the least tomato flavor, grow Honey Drop. It's still the best of both worlds because there's lots of rich tomato flavor, but it, Honey Drop is our sweetest cherry tomato of all time. Now you know. Um, and what kind of resistance does cherry ember have? Great question, Michael. Cherry ember has no disease resistance. If you're looking for a disease resistant septoria leaf spot, early blight, late blight, you want, here are the four tomatoes that we have that are incredibly t disease resistant. You want coyote, Chiapas, those are two varieties that are cherries. Coyote is yellow, Chiapas is red, and then Brandy Wise, not Brandy Wine, uh, not Brandy Wine, but Brandy Wise, is a great big red slicer that has Brandy Wise, Brandy Wine, and her parentage, but also a disease resistant parent from Cornell. So it has all of the best of both worlds that delicious heirloom flavor plus the disease resistance as well as Summer Sweetheart, which is a little saladette style. Um, that is super sweet and also really crack resistant. So yeah, if you're looking for, and there's a few other varieties that are, have some semi-tolerance of diseases, but alas, a cherry ember is not one of them. One of them. And Chuck says, hello, a few months ago, I assembled a Hugo culture mound and I already have potatoes coming up. However, wanted to ask if you have any experience or knowledge with strategy or advice for success. Yes, I love and have made many Hugo cultures. Um, and so much depends. Um, and if you, if you didn't already, like I would keep feeding it, you know, like, and also just grow plants that pretty much grow themselves. And potatoes are a great one where like, if plants need a lot of tender, loving care, Hugo culture is not a great um, strategy for them. But something like a potato, something even like a cucumber, honestly, or even just scatter shot, like lettuce mix. And if you're, if you're happy to just go in and like forage on it, you're gonna be happy. If it's a tender eggplant that's like, I don't know, that seems like a little bit less consistent and awkward in terms of watering and our nu nutrients are here, but not consistently over here. And so if it's a finicky plant, it doesn't want to thrive. <laughs> it won't thrive in a Hugo culture, but if it's not finicky, go to town and enjoy every moment. <laughs> and Jessica says, I grew the coyote this past season. They were so good and so abundant. Yes, that's amazing. 
And Ellie says, <laughs> Ellie says, good morning. I had such a wonderful success with my crop of provider bush beans this summer and would like to grow them indoors in a pot with your grow lights this winter as the beans you find in the store this time of year are terrible. Any advice? Oh, my honestly, my honest advice is if it brings you joy to try, I won't stop you. I don't think you'll be very successful. Beans just really, really, really want, even though our full spectrum lights are awesome and we have friends growing tomatoes on them. I mean, they're just, but it's not like, ugh, it's nothing, it's nothing like the sun and it's nothing like what you will harvest. So I do, I recommend growing them in the biggest containers that you can with the richest soil that you possibly can. Um, but I also recommend just having some pretty low expectations and generally what we found for the most significant harvests over the winter under our lights are just greens. As a general rule, it takes much less energy to grow a green leaf, which is its own photosynthetic like solar array, right? It's much less expensive to grow more self-sustaining leaves than it is to invest in a in a fruit essentially whether it's a pod of a bean or you know a lemon or you know a tomato um so yeah i don't want to dissuade you and i just want to temper your expectations yeah because it's not worth buying the beans in the store absolutely on so many levels but growing your own indoors is not is not an easy scenario either so I'm so glad that you asked. And ooh, what's next? Cleome or Cleome. I've heard tomato, tomato. Lots of people say lots of things. Um, and Ellie says, thank you for the info. You're so welcome. Let me know what you're learning, Ellie. And I love to be wrong. And I would love to be wrong in this case. I would love for you to be surrounded by bean abundance. And what I love about Cleome is that she is so beautiful and so abundant. She starts blossoming like mid end of June and then just goes to frost for us here in zone five and we'd never harvest her because she has all of these pretty significant impressive little green thorns that make it very uncomfortable to harvest by that nature she also is very uncomfortable for deer to eat so cleome is one of the most deer resistant plants <laughs> <laughs> that I have found. <laughs> so if you're, if you're concerned about deer in your life and you want to grow flowers, Cleome is your friend. So yes, now you know, and your deer will be, might be disappointed, but your beneficial pollinators will lose their minds and be so grateful for you. And here's a brand new carrot we're sharing, Yellowstone. And we love Yellowstone because I mean, there's lots of different colors of carrots, but here's the thing, most of the time, a colored carrot is being selected for its color rather than her flavor. So there's lots of different colors of carrots, but they're not usually as delicious as just a classic orange carrot. So we've been trialing lots of different types and Yellowstone is the best of both worlds. She glows gold and she has lovely sweetness and rich carrot flavor. So yes, Yellowstone, exception to the rule that rainbow carrots aren't as delicious as orange carrots. So now you know and enjoy every bite. Oh, and she's yellow too. This teddy bear sunflower is a dwarf. She's compact. She's only about this tall. Um, and I'm not standing up. She's only about this tall. <laughs> so she's delightfully short. And look at all those petals. And sunflowers are edible. If you didn't know, I just learned this a few years ago. Sunflower petals are edible. And look how many petals are on these sunflowers. So yes, teddy bear, so aptly named. And um, accurately named, I don't know if she's aptly named though, Giant White, while she's certainly accurate, I just wish the person who had named <laughs> Benary's Giant White had more imagination because, oh my gosh, she is so much more resplendent than just being giant and white. There's just like luminescent ivory, long, strong stems, perfect for cutting. And she blossoms all season long. And Zinnia Vey's life is just epic, often two plus weeks. Um, so another wonderful Zinnia to have in our lives. And oh my gosh, this apricot peach straw flower is so heavenly. I love straw flowers as fresh and especially as dry flowers. Our dear friend Kira just surprised us with a little bottle of her home 
grown honey and out of this box popped not confetti but actually the straw flowers she's plucked the heads of the straw flowers dried them and then is using putting them in gifts and it's the most wonderful thing and pam has direct start zinnias direct so in a greenhouse um or in yes yeah, so you can do both you can direct sow zinnias or you can transplant them I like to transplant them because then you get that many more blooms that much earlier. But here's the thing, if zinnias are stressed as a transplant, they revert back to single blooms. So these, I mean, they're like dahlias, right? Look how many petals are on the zinnia. That's like a dahlia of a zinnia. And so if they are stressed as transplants, they revert back to single blooms. So instead of having dozens and dozens of endless unfolding petals, there's just one single ray of petals around the center. And so that's still nice, but it's not like breathtaking and incredible. It's not why you buy grow zinnias. So yes, you can direct sow them. They'll start flowering a little later. And if you do transplant them, which I do recommend, um, be sure just be sure that you don't start them any later, any earlier than four weeks before final frost and make sure they're not root bound or otherwise stressed so you have the full glory of their petals. And pink plume celery, oh my gosh. So this, I love celery and I love growing celery. Celery is one of the most challenging plants to grow. And it just takes a lot of fertility, a lot of water. It's easy to grow mediocre celery. It's hard to grow incredible celery. So our friend Christina actually introduced us to pink plume and I just love her and she like preferred it as like this bouquet of flowers. And in fact, oh my gosh. <laughs> It's just so beautiful. And so the stems, instead of being big, fat, wide, and like ants on a log style celery, think like it's parsley that tastes like celery with a lot of, a lot, a little bit of anise flavor too. So they're thinner stems that are just all those vivid colors and the stem and the leaf is similarly delicious. So we love them on salads, dressings. I just munch on them throughout the fields. I love, I love this in so many contexts in the kitchen. So, and I just love the color purple. If you didn't already, now that you know that I love color, the color purple, you'll go to our website, fruitionseeds.com and be like, yeah, <laughs> somebody loves purple. <laughs> It's me. <laughs> and Bonnie says, yes, no luck with celery except for the pink. Yeah, totally, 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 totally. So I'm so glad you've had that experience as well. And next, let's talk about, oh my gosh, scabiosa. So scabiosas, we have two. We have this beautiful Molo and then also a Black Beauty, which is this like deep, rich, like midnight plum purple color. And I love scabiosa because she's just exquisite. Her stems are long and they often just wend and wind in the most <laughs> whimsical ways. And insects, beneficial pollinators love, love, love her. She blossoms so abundantly and her seed pods are really fascinating too. She's really easy to save the seed of. So yeah, two new varieties of scabiosa and also, oh my gosh, this yarrow. So yarrow is a brilliant cut flower. Also she's native. Also she's perennial. So check out all of those different colors in this yarrow, summer berries. And she's actually over there. <laughs> I wish you could see her. She's still blossoming. It's mid-December. It's the third night of Hanukkah <laughs> and the yarrow is still blossoming. And it's incredible. Yarrow is incredible medicine as well. And we actually eat the young leaves too. So in spring, she's one of the first, first plants to emerge out of the snowbanks and those young, tiny, tender leaves that look more like feathers than leaves of kale. Pardon me. <laughs> what am I thinking about? <laughs> leaves of yarrow. We actually tuck them in salads. They're so delicious. Um, and oh my gosh, another beautiful flower. This one from Frank Morton, Wild Garden Seeds. If you don't already know Frank and Wild Garden Seeds, check out his offerings. Such incredible seeds. And so this is a brand new variety from Frank where thank you to the millennia of indigenous plant breeders who have, are the foundation of everything that we eat. <laughs> <laughs> and everything that we air, wear and so much of our medicine. Um, but Frank crossed Grandpa Ott's Morning Glory. 
a bright purple morning glory with Venice Carnival. And now it's the best of both worlds. So it's a kaleidoscope of pink purple cream and it's so beautiful, so easy to grow. She climbs up anything. So that's a, one of our new varieties from 2021. Also a new variety, our Lime Light Spray Millet. And so this is another kind of cut flower, if you will. I love cut flowers that are not necessarily flowers, but these, yeah, these ornamental grains. And she's also delicious. If you wanna grow your own <laughs> grain, millet is a great choice. Um, and also, if you have parakeets or other birds in your house, they will love your millet too. <laughs> Right, and it's so easy to grow ludic ludicrous quantities of your own. Um, but as a dry flower as well as fresh, that is really why we love to grow and save the seeds of limelight millet. And a nui nui um, lettuce. Yes, Katie says, my chickens love millet. Yes, totally. <laughs> and it's so satisfying to just throw this beautiful bouquet down in front of them and just see them pick, peck through it. Oh, I love it so much. And this is a brand new lettuce that we're sharing. It's a variety called a nui nui, which is the a Hawaiian word for rainbow. And this is a super heat tolerant lettuce from the courtesy of the University of Hawaii. So don't take my word for it. It's incredibly bolt tolerant, heat tolerant. So <laughs> it's a Batavian style. So great big, beautiful leaves with a tender blanched heart, super delicious. Um, and we also have another mix. So this mix of lettuce is heat tolerant as well. Hip, hip, hooray. So this is great for baby leaves where the Anui Nui is a best as a great big head of lettuce. And all different colors, shapes, all different sizes, flavors. So lots of diversity in this mix. One of the many reasons we love it. And oh my gosh, a new spinach. This is the most cold hardy spinach that we have yet found that is open pollinated and heirloom. So it is called Giant Winter and indeed, um, we're about to harvest our third cutting of it and it's going to be delicious <laughs> all the way through May. And I can't wait for you to enjoy it as well. And Richard says, how tall will 10 fingers of Naples and Italian heirloom plants grow? We're in Boulder, Colorado, sending love to Boulder and the flat irons, planning the greenhouse planting for next year. So Italian heirloom is indeterminate. It's not gonna stop, trellis it fully. And 10 fingers of Naples, Naples is semi-determinate. So it's still gonna get five feet tall. And it's going to continue to blossom throughout the year, um, like all summer long, but it does have this big crush of, in, of um, blossoms and fruit all at once. So it's not fully determinate. Um, it's not going to grow, and so it's not, it's still going to be significant in terms of trellising. Um, but yes, 10 fingers, semi-determinate, Italian heirloom, fully indeterminate. So, oh my gosh, just a few more varieties left. Ah, and these aren't even all of them. I just had to pick out a few of my favorites. Um, this is Honey Badger Sweet Corn, and I just love the name. And of course, like Honey Badger, what's not to love? But it also is a reference to the fact that it's a collaboration between the Organic Seed Alliance and University of Wisconsin-Madison. And Wisconsin-Madison, their mascot essentially is a badger. <laughs> so, um, hence Honey Badger. And we love Honey Badger because she's just so early. And I love that pearlescent pink bicolor. And so yes, if you're going sweet corn in short seasons and you want it sweet, Honey Badger is a marvelous choice. And also Trombonchino, check it out. This is a fabulous summer squash. So an unusual summer squash. Yes, look how much it curls and spirals. She's just amazing. If you want a straight, trellis her. On the ground, she will continue to spiral in the most wonderful ways. And here's the thing that I love about Trombonchino as well. If you have squash vine borer, this is your go-to because she is a cucurbita machata as opposed to cucurbita pipo, which is most classic zucchini, patty pan, um, and summer squash. 
and Cucurbita maxima as well, susceptible to, to the squash vine borer. So it's so hard to get rid of squash vine borer. Check out our blog that is <laughs> the <laughs> ways, three ways, three ways to rid yourself of the dread squash vine borer. But hands down, the best way is to grow Cucurbita machata only, no Pipo or Maxima for three years because you will starve her out. And so, yes, it's sad to not be growing zucchini. I couldn't agree more. But the fact that you can have this incredibly fun, flavorful zucchini that is effectively starving out your squash vine more, I don't think you'll look back. <laughs> I think you'll be so grateful and thrilled. Um, and I love stuffing her blossoms, uh, male blossoms, full pollen giving blossoms, full of all kinds of delicious things as well. And Sheila says, hi from Rochester, exciting info. Hi, Sheila. Can't wait to share the farm with you here one day. And Jolene, good morning, good Jolene. Have you tried zucchini rampicante? It's a cucurbita machata. Also, how is trombonchino different? Oh my gosh, I don't know zucchino rampicante, and I am about to Google this as soon as we are not live. So, oh my gosh, feel free to send me some pictures or any other references you have to it, Jolene. I am not familiar and I can't wait to hear everything about it. Oh my gosh, we can be friends. Let me count the ways. <laughs> so there's just a couple more um, new varieties for 2021. Um, and yes, another tomato. This is an heirloom from the Vesuvius region of <laughs> Italy, Pianolo del Vesuvio. And it is an incredible paste tomato. It's quite small and has this lovely dimple on the end and it is so flavorful. And here's the thing. Historically, these folks around Vesuvius have been harvesting her beautiful tresses and then hanging them, as you can kind of see, in all of like hanging them <laughs> in these beautiful ristra like tresses. And then that's how they store them historically, right? Before freezing, before canning. And so they last a very long time just sitting there hanging in your kitchen and then deepening and and richening their flavor. I don't think that's a word, but I think you know what I mean. And indeed, they are so delicious. And so, yes, Pianolo del Vesuvio. And of course, Italian heirloom, but let's talk tomatoes indigenous to Central South America where they've been domesticated and selected for millennia. And so it's the colonizers that came to the new world and brought tomatoes, Lycopersicon, Lycopersicum, back to Europe. It took hundreds of years for tomatoes actually to be grown joyfully and not as a decorative poisonous ornamental, poisonous ornamental in Europe. But when they finally caught a hold of it. Um, they made some amazing varieties in Italy. So yes, Italian heirloom, but let's talk colonization. We see you. Thank you for all the indigenous plant breeders in Central and South America who have, <laughs> who are the foundation of every tomato that we know and love and so many other crops as well, including zucchini and oh, uh, so many things. I digress. I don't digress. What else are we talking about? But let's talk about this beet too, because, oh my gosh, Lutz green leaf is called Lutz green leaf because it has this beautiful beet root, as you might expect. But green leaf refers to the fact that it has Swiss chard like leaves. They're so much larger than a classic beet. And so if you love beet greens, you will love Lutz. And fast facts, beets and Swiss chard, same genus species, beta vulgaris, and that's why some of these varieties like Lutz green leaf can be the best of both worlds so easily. Oh, and Jolene says, I got that zucchini rapicante from Baker's Creek a few years ago. It grows like a bandit and it overplant. I overplanted a large container. It still went nuts. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I can't wait to grow it. This is our trials this year. Thank you so much, Jolene. Oh, and just a couple more. There's this jade green bean, which is similar to provider, but much more flavorful. And it has more disease resistance and is equally easy to grow. And then if you didn't already see, we have these great big packets of micro green seeds. So we have radishes and arugula and broccoli and kale and all kinds of things, all kinds. And you can use them as maracas too. 
<laughs> but each packet you'll grow several trays of microgreens. And if you want to learn more about microgreens, we have a whole awesome free, not mini course, but it's a micro course for growing microgreens at home. And it's free. You'll find it on our website along with all these other seeds at fruitionseeds.com. And friends, thank you so much for joining. And I apologize. Usually our live Q&As are much more... <laughs> <laughs> popcorn style and this and that and talking about all kinds of things and thank you for indulging me sharing our beautiful babies this morning when people ask Matthew and I if we have children we laugh and say yes and great 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 grandchildren and they grow us more than we grow them and we're so honored to share them with you so I love to share um, and Michael asked, do you have a catalog online, fruitionseeds.com? We have no paper catalog, but we have a beautiful online catalog that's actually going to be a lot more beautiful in a few weeks. We're working on a brand new website. Whoa, that is a labor of love and it is so beautiful. It's so much better than our new, than our current site, but our new site, our current site, people are still like, you have one of the most beautiful websites, so get ready. <laughs> but fruitionseeds.com is our website. And that is where you will find all of these creatures and so many more. And we actually have a few more new varieties that are still getting germination tested. So stay tuned. And so I love to begin and end all of our live Q&As, all of our time together with a poem, quote, story, something. And this morning, words from Vendana Shiva. It is not an investment if it's destroying the planet. Once more, Vandana Shiva. It is not an investment if you are destroying the planet. And I share these words with you, especially this morning, because right now, as we sit here together, it's so good to be together. There are 250 million people in India who are striking, who are striking because three weeks ago, there were three incredible laws passed that make it incredibly difficult for small farmers to not just thrive, but exist. And so because 60% of the Indian population is involved in small agriculture, <laughs> they're striking. They are striking. Look up the news. If you haven't seen it already, 250 million people striking in India because small farmers are incredibly at risk right now from government not supporting them. And the some amazing thing about me and thinking about this for me is that I was thinking, wow, 250 million people, like I can't even imagine 250,000 people like gathering around something in the United States, much less 250 million people and 60% of people involved in agriculture in India. Like it's less than 1% of people um, in North America that are involved in agriculture in any significant way. And then I was like, wait a minute, every one of us that eats, <laughs> we're involved in agriculture. Like it should be this personal for us too. And I can tell you as a small farmer, as a small organic farmer, it is impressively difficult to exist. That our government so clearly is set up for big agriculture and big business to keep getting bigger and keep swallowing up and making small companies, farms, harder and harder to exist. And I know this way too personally. And I choose to talk about all kinds of other things and not these things. But if we want to talk about this, we can too, because we should be talking about it. It's incredibly difficult to survive as a small farm. And thank you for caring. Thank you for being a part of our fruition family and making it possible for us to continue doing what we love to do. And we do it for you. And please dive in, learn more about India and the amazing ways that India is rising up and 250 million people <laughs> striking in India right now because they believe in small farms and small farmers feeding the world because they are. So, Anyhow, 
Thank you for being you. Thank you for caring, for growing, for sowing seeds. Even if you never have sown a seed in your life every day that you eat, I'm so grateful that there are farmers and small farmers making this possible in the world. So sending so much love from our gardens to yours, friends. And in the meantime, don't be shy and happy December.